introduce the speaker, I want to make a few brief announcements. We know many of you are listening in from far away and can't attend local events or programs. That's why we provide this free webinar series. We host multiple webinars per month, so please visit our website to view the current schedule for 2017. Simply visit our website at www.johnson-center.org and click on the webinars link on the right hand side. New webinars and events are often added, so if you are not on our email list, I encourage you to visit our website and click on the join our email list link that appears on the home page. We still have some great summer events coming up, including free family fun, sibling summer camps, and social skills groups. To get instant news and events from the Johnson Center, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, as we often announce grant and scholarship opportunities, research opportunities, and last minute events and presentations there. For those of you who are local, be sure to check out our junior series, free family fun events for all children ages four to 10. You can find information on our Facebook page and our website. And be sure to follow our colleagues at the Autism Research Institute as they host their own webinar initiative and they share some great resources on their website and social media pages. Before we begin the presentation, please note that questions may be typed into your control panel throughout the presentation and time permitting, they will be addressed during the presentation. Also, for those who have requested copies of the presentation, we don't send out the presentation slides. However, we do post recordings of all of our free webinars on the Johnson Center YouTube channel found on YouTube backslash the Johnson Center, and there's no spaces in there, and subscribe to get full access to all of our recorded webinars. If you would like a certificate of attendance after today's webinar, look for a follow-up email in your mailbox one hour after the webinar concludes. It will contain instructions on how to download your certificate. Now, please welcome today's presenter, Morgan Devlin, Research Associate here at the Johnson Center. Hi everyone, thank you for joining me and welcome to today's webinar. Today I'm going to be talking about the current state of research regarding the symptoms of ASD and the effectiveness of treatments using different types of technology. I will first go over the different types of interventions for ASD and then I'll give you some examples of these interventions and their main goals. Next, I will talk about the current roles of technology in this capacity, mainly how different types of technology are currently implemented in the various ASD interventions. I will then finish by giving specific examples of both interventions and technology and how they can work together. I will also touch on areas of emerging research as well. Whether it's at home or in the classroom, technology is a booming field that children with ASD can utilize and benefit from in more ways than one. My goals with this webinar are to define and explain the different types of empirically supported interventions for ASD. I also want to emphasize different types of technologies and describe their current roles in these interventions. And lastly, I want to provide specific examples of each and how they work together. Because technology is evolving rapidly and new discoveries and innovations are happening daily, I wanted to make this webinar a tool that you could use to navigate the waters of emerging tech and decide what devices and or software would be more, most beneficial for your child with ASD in your family. I hope that as new apps are developed and put on the market, you will be able to evaluate them and make decisions based on your child's individual needs and whether or not that particular app would benefit them. I also want to stop here and remind you that this webinar will be made available for playback on our YouTube channel. I'm going to mention a lot of specific apps and devices that you may or may not have heard about prior to this webinar. While we don't share our slides, you will still be able to access this information once the webinar is over. So let's get started. I'm going to begin by giving a brief summary of the different types of interventions for ASD. As you may know, because no single cause of ASD has yet been identified, there is no single recognized treatment. The treatments or interventions for ASD vary widely and expand across a wide range of disciplines. From behavioral therapies to medication, as well as nutrition and dietary interventions, 
there are, there are a multitude of areas of development that are affected by autism spectrum disorder and therefore multiple interventions. Each individual's treatment plan has goals based on the needs and skills of the individual. These treatment plans can vary drastically among individuals with ASD. Keep this in mind as we discuss different methods of intervention and what may or may not work best for your child. Like I mentioned, there are a ton of different interventions for ASD out there. Google ASD treatments and you can come up with some pretty interesting things in a list a mile long. It is not the case, however, that all of these interventions are empirically supported or backed by scientific research, although the most popular are. Interventions that research has shown to be an effective means of treatment for children with ASD are known as evidence-based practices. Evidence-based practices are unique because they provide an integration of best and current empirical evidence, clinical and educational expertise, as well as the patient and caregiver perspectives. There are currently 27 different evidence-based practices recognized by the National Professional Development Center of Autism Spectrum Disorder, or NPDC for short. We'll talk about a few of these specific practices later. Furthermore, the National Autism Center has performed essentially a meta-analysis or a review of all of the educational and behavioral intervention literature targeting the core characteristics and associated symptoms of ASD and its outcomes. What is known as the National Standards Project was developed in order to provide straightforward information to parents, educators, and service providers that can help to make informed treatment decisions as well as to promote evidence-based practice in the treatment of ASD. The core features investigated in the literature include social skills, communication, repetitive or problem behaviors, adaptive behaviors, and academic skills. This project also aims to create guidelines for evidence-based practices for ASD that address the limitations of the previous guidelines. So far, there have been two phases released. Phase one released in 2009 examined and quantified the level of research supporting interventions that target the core characteristics of ASD in children, adolescents, and young adults under the age of 22 on the autism spectrum. Phase two released in 2015 essentially provides an update to phase one. Combined, the two phases examine literature from a span of close to 60 years, including over 400 scientific articles. The results of the most recent report of the National Standards Project identify 14 established treatments for ASD. Established treatments are those tested by controlled scientific experiments which repeatedly produce beneficial outcomes and are known to be effective for individuals on the autism spectrum. These practices have the most empirical support or are backed by the most scientific research. Well, now you might be thinking, that definition sounds really similar to the other thing we were just talking about, the evidence-based practices, so what's the difference? Well, if you'll recall, the evidence-based practices contain a little something extra. While they too are supported by empirical evidence, they also incorporate clinical expertise as well as the patient perspectives into their intervention strategies. But still, they are similar. So similar, in fact, that there are overlapping intervention strategies in what are considered evidence-based practices and established treatments. 21 of the practices identified by NPDC as evidence-based were also considered established by the National Standards Project. Again, these established treatments have the most scientific evidence backing the treatment investigated. Four NPDC evidence-based practices were considered emerging practices by the National Standards Project. These emerging practices don't have quite enough support to be considered established, but they do have some empirical support as opposed to other interventions that have none. By support here, I mean published literature. For example, an emerging practice would say have four published peer-reviewed articles showing evidence of the treatment investigated as being effective for people with ASD, whereas an established treatment would have nine published articles supporting this intervention. Now, I won't go over all 21 of the interventions these two institutions found in common, but I will hit a few of the important ones. For the purposes of this webinar, the practices I go over will be the most pertinent to technology being used as a method to implement the treatment or practice itself. <clears throat> a few of the different evidence-based practices fall under a single category in the National Standards Project, namely the behavioral interventions. I'll briefly go over a few of the established treatments now. As a disclaimer, I just want to say for the purposes of this webinar, I only aim to describe and highlight key points of these intervention strategies to help you become more familiar with the terminology and to, <clears throat> excuse me, and to expose you to different methods of treatment that may be beneficial to your child or family. Please do your research or seek advice from a qualified professional before implementing new treatments. 
The established treatments um, I'm going to talk about are defined by the National Autism Center, and you can find more in information on the treatments by visiting their website. Also, as I explain these different intervention strategies, you can kind of develop a sense of the roles various forms of technology could play in each of these therapies. So keep that in the back of your mind as we go through them. <clears throat> First off, behavioral interventions are designed to reduce problem behavior and teach functional or alternative behaviors or skills through the application of basic principles of behavior change. This can include the use of prompts, extinction, redirection, or reinforcement. Treatments falling into this category reflect research representing the fields of applied behavior analysis, or more, more commonly known as ABA therapy, um, behavioral psychology, and positive behavior supports. Some other forms of behavioral intervention you might be familiar with include discrete trial training, task analysis, or time delay. Modeling interventions rely on adult or peers providing a demonstration of the target behavior that should result in an imitation of the target behavior by the individual with ASD. Modeling can include simple and complex behaviors. This intervention is often combined with other strategies such as prompting and reinforcement. Examples include include live modeling as well as video modeling. Natural teaching strategies involve using primarily child-directed interactions to teach functional skills in the natural environment. So for example, social skills and peer work. These interventions often involve providing a stimulating environment, modeling how to play, encouraging conversation, providing choices, and rewarding reasonable attempts. Examples of this type of approach include but are not limited to focus stimulation and incidental teaching. Parent training entails parents directly using in individualized intervention practices with their child to increase positive learning opportunities and the acquisition of important skills. Peer training, on the other hand, um, involves teaching children without disabilities strategies for facilitating play and social interactions with children on the autism spectrum. Peers may often include classmates or siblings. Um, oftentimes, this, can, this type of peer training can include both initiation training as well as peer training. These interventions may include other components um, from different treatment packages as well, such as self-management for peers, um, prompting, or reinforcement. Common names for intervention strategies include peer networks, circle of friends, buddy skills package, um, integrated playgroups, peer initiation training, and peer-mediated social interactions. Pivotal response training, or PRT, is a treatment that focuses, focuses on targeting pivotal behavioral areas, such as motivation, self-management, and responsiveness. Key aspects of PRT intervention delivery focus on parent involvement in the intervention delivery itself and on intervention in the natural environment, such as homes and schools, with the goal of producing naturalized behavioral improvements. Schedules are interventions that involve the presentation of a task list list that communicates a series of activities or steps required to complete a specific activity. Schedules are often supplemented by other interventions such as reinforcement. Schedules can take several forms including written words, pictures, or photographs, or workstations. Similarly, scripting interventions involve developing a verbal and or written script about a specific skill or situation which serves as a model for the child with ASD. Scripts are usually practiced before the skill is used in the actual situation. Self-management interventions involve promoting independence by teaching individuals with ASD to regulate their behavior by recording the occurrence or non-occurrence of the target behavior and securing reinforcement for doing so. Initial, initial skills development may involve other strategies and may include the task of setting one's own goals. In addition, reinforcement is a component of this intervention with the individual with ASD independently seeking and or delivering reinforcers. Examples of self-management interventions include the use of checklists, risk counters, visual prompts, and tokens. Lastly, story-based interventions involve a written description of the situations under which specific behaviors are expected to occur. Like other interventions, stories may be supplemented with additional components for example, prompting, reinforcement, um, or discussion, things like that. Social stories are the most well-known story-based interventions, and they seek to answer the who, what, when, where, and why in order to improve perspective taking in different situations. Now, did you notice any interventions where technology might play an important role in the treatment itself? 
maybe in interventions utilizing visual displays like modeling or story-based interventions. Perhaps other interventions where communication is a major component like, like scripting or PRT. Technology can be used as a tool to help individuals with ASD achieve goals outlined by these treatment plans. In fact, there are many different applications and systems that are tailored specifically to different areas where children with ASD struggle most. These types of devices and applications are known as technology-based interventions. Technolo technology-based in instruction and interventions were identified as an emerging treatment by the NPDC and National Standards Project. Project. One specific type of technology-based intervention worth mentioning is Augmentative and Alternative Communication, or AACs. Certain AAC practices lack the amount of evidence <clears throat> found for established treatments, but have recently been gaining enough evidence to be considered an evidence-based practice or an emerging treatment. AACs are one of the best examples of tech integrated into a treatment intervention for individuals with ASD. Now that I've briefly gone over the different practices, I want to talk about the different forms of technology and their role or potential role in ASD interventions. Again, because of the vast differences in symptomology among individuals with ASD, it is important to keep in mind how these different forms of technology would best suit your child. And I'll revisit this idea later on. Now, the earlier AAC models were more computer-based, analog, and much less versatile. While they can and still do serve multiple functions, they aren't necessarily as accessible or flexible as, say, an iPad, for an example. Um, this, in part, has to do with the software made available for each of the dev these devices, as well as the improvements in technology in general over the years. Some of the earliest AAC devices developed in the 80s don't have as much power as the, smart as the smartphones of today. Nonetheless, it is not uncommon for older models to be recommended and utilized for certain individuals. This is one area of ASD intervention where technology has made the most impact on an individual basis. AACs are very dependent on an individual's abilities and skills. As I mentioned earlier, every treatment plan is so unique and based on the specific needs and skills of an individual seeking treatment. So what are these devices? Well, a brief overview would give you augmentative and alternative communication divided into two categories, unaided and aided. Unaided AAC requires good fine motor skills, offers an unlimited vocabulary, and is portable. Think of sign language. Sign language requires fine motor skills for effective communication using hand signs, offers an expanded vocabulary, and your hands go everywhere you do, so maximum portability. Conversely, aided AAC requires lower fine motor skills, is more, more readily comprehensible, isn't as portable, and utilizes a more limited vocabulary. For example, these devices can include schedules, visual, visual clue, cues, electronic devices, communication boards and keyboards, as well as visual scene displays. Basically, you can think of AAC devices as anything that provides the opportunity and promotes a child's ability to say anything about anything at any time. The goal of augmentative and alternative communication is to promote spontaneous novel utterance generation. These devices help to, help to fulfill this goal by compensating for or replacing speech. Now let's take a look at the current state of some of these devices. I'll try to go over the basic function of each device as well as pros and cons without getting too specific regarding the different brands. So let's start with smart boards. A similar concept to an overhead projector and transparency sheets from a few years ago, a smart board is essentially a projector with light rays technology. This technology uses lasers to recognize what the individual has written on the wall or projection and can differentiate between touch or pen use. Smart boards work better for a group setting. They are typically utilized in the classroom. And the smart board's large size allows for different levels of representation to meet the needs of different students. The smart boards also come equipped with microphones and cameras for auditory and visual applications as well. Similarly, mini or Pico projectors can be thought of as personal projectors. They tend to work better for children who need one-on-one -on -one interaction separate from the group. These are extremely portable and when connected to an iPad or other device, lessons and activities can happen virtually anywhere. Mini projectors are also significantly cheaper as an alternative option if a smart board isn't feasible. 
For one example, smart boards or mini projectors can be utilized in story-based interventions. Let's say a class of children with ASD is preparing for an upcoming field trip to the local Natural History Museum. As this trip is a drastic change from their everyday routine, the class can prepare for the trip together by using a vis visual schedule or social story created together on the smart board. This will help them know what to expect when visiting the museum and make for an easier transition. Arguably, the most popular and prevalent form of technology used in treatments for ASD are different applications implemented through iPads or other handheld devices and tablets. While more expensive, these devices are portable, lightweight, and host to a vast multi multitude of applications with new ones developing every day. The size of these tablets allow for maximum mobility while still offering a decently sized interface allowing children to be more hands-on. These devices serve a variety of functions using apps alone. A lot of AAC specific apps have been and are being developed for the specifically for the use by children with ASD. Other features of the tablets, like the camera, allow for better data collection as well as video and photo modeling. Features like these also allow for a multimodality of cues presented by the device. Using short videos or other visual and auditory cues, tablets can be a helpful to tool in modeling and behavioral interventions. Applications specific to self-management skills, like reminders or the calendar app, help promote independence by teachers using by teaching users with ASD to regulate their behavior by recording the occurrence or non-occurrence of this target behavior, like setting a reminder to brush your teeth before bed. Mainstream, mainstream tablets like the iPad, Windows Surface, or Samsung Galaxy are highly accessible and versatile. You can get most of these at your local Walmart or Target. However, it should be noted that not all tablets are created equal. This might go without saying, but some brands can be significantly more expensive than others and less durable. Also, different devices run using different software, and not all software is compatible with all devices. You'll find this namely in your Apple and Android or Google products, the two biggest players on the market. If you have some sort of smart device at home, you probably already know that not all applications available in Apple's App Store are also available to be downloaded for Android devices via Google Play. Currently, there are more AAC apps available for Apple products than Android at this time. Although I do want to point out that Android is becoming more cost effective as Google, Google's Android software is compatible with multiple um, manufacturers of tablets like Samsung and Huawei, whereas Apple's operating system will only work for the Apple products. Similarly, the Windows Surface tablet has even fewer apps available than Android or Apple compatible products. The Windows Surface, however, can run full Windows applications like Word and PowerPoint and has USB ports to connect with other devices like hard drives and monitors. Wearable technology is also gaining popularity among ASD researchers because of its accessibility and portability. Thanks to Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and other tech communication systems, different devices can interact with each other, offering a multimodality of signals, meaning that the user can receive notifications in multiple ways. Wearable devices, such as the Apple Watch, Fitbit, Pebble Watch, and others, interact with your phone to share data from different apps. Generally, these wearable devices offer haptic cues or low-intensity vibrations to notify you of incoming text messages, phone calls, reminders, calendar events, whatever you prefer via your notification settings. These devices offer a lot of possibilities for children with ASD. For example, if in a classroom setting, using features like messages, an educator or therapist could prompt a child with ASD to raise their hand if they knew the answer to a question or wanted to ask one. Heart rate monitors installed in wearable technology like Fitbits or Apple Watch could allow for additional data collection and tracking for a child with ASD. The watches also offer a possibility of multimodality of information delivery and comprehension as well. Returning to my previous example in the classroom, if a child is interacting with their peer and the therapist or teacher wanted to prompt them to begin using a script that had been practiced beforehand for this specific interaction, the Apple Watch could allow for visual, auditory, haptic cues, or even a combination of the three to be sent to the child discreetly. Also, as a use, useful self-management tool, this wearable device allows the child wearing it to track his or her own behaviors and physiological responses in order to recognize emotions and regulate their own behavior. It has also been shown that anxiety is hard to measure in children with ASD due to an inability to express their emotions and or communicate them effectively. Reveal claims to help solve this problem and prevent meltdowns in children with ASD. 
similar to the Apple Watch and other fitness trackers. Reveal by Awake Labs is a wearable device that measures and tracks physiological changes that signify a change in stress and anxiety levels. Specifically, Reveal measures heart rate, temperature, and electrodermal activity, which has to do with perspiration. The corresponding app tracks these changes over time and eventually will be able to notify parents, caregivers, or educators if a child is physically stressed or, as they claim, about to have a meltdown. Preventative measures can then be taken to relieve the child and offer support. Some downfalls with this technology is that for the watch or wearable to receive data from the phone and vice versa, they must remain in reasonably close proximity to each other due to the limitations of Bluetooth, otherwise they must be connected to Wi-Fi. So not only are you keeping up with one device, you have to keep up with two. Secondly, haptic cues or different vibra vibration patterns could pose problems to those with sensory issues that wouldn't be able to tolerate the vibration or pressure from the wristband. Another popular form of wearable device includes those featuring heads-up displays as seen in virtual and augmented reality devices. Firstly, I want to mention there is a difference between virtual and augmented reality. Virtual reality allows you to experience a reality that isn't real. It allows you to create and experience an environment that is a complete simulation. For example, with the Oculus Rift, it allows the user to have full control over the creation of the environment that they are in. Florio is a virtual reality application targeted at children with ASD that provides an engaging and supervised experience to the user. Florio utilizes story-based intervention strategies as well as modeling and naturalistic observation strategies to build real-world social and communication skills. Augmented reality, on the other hand, allows you to see your current environment with augmented features or stamps on top of it. In this next clip, I have a video showcasing the Microsoft HoloLens to kind of give you a better idea of what I mean by images being stamped on top of the user's existing environment. Using a head-mounted display, you can see how simulated and interactive holographics appear a part of the user's actual environment. Now, as I mentioned previously, children with ASD often find it difficult to read facial expressions, pick up visual cues, or pay attention to another person while they speak. Possibilities are seemingly endless for this form of technology in the treatment of ASD. The creation of simulated environments for use in story-based interventions, modeling, as well as behavioral interventions and social skills training could be immensely convenient and helpful to those who benefit from more dynamic visual and auditory displays as opposed to written instruction. For example, a child with ASD wears a head-mounted display which shows images of a virtual classroom. This classroom contains a set of 3D virtual classmates who deliver an individual presentation. But each of these avatars starts to fade if the child looks away or loses interest. By doing so, this helps 
keep the child's focus and attention on the presenters and the replication of the behavior will help build eye contact and attention skills. Similarly, with, as with other wearable devices, children with sensory se sensitivities may have trouble tolerating the constant pressure from the head-mounted display or the projected holographics themselves, depending on brightness or satura saturation levels. I want to preface this next section with a little aside about speech synthesis, which has come such a long way in recent years. Being able to normalize computer-generated phrases and voices to the point where they are somewhat personalized plays a huge role in how we perceive and respond to our artificial intelligence-like devices. For our purposes today, when I refer to AI, I mean Siri or Google now. Yes, these programs are not explicitly artificial intelligence, as true AI is completely independent, but these, program but these are programs that are designed to respond in a preset and calculated way based on human interaction. These programs present an opportunity to gain information quickly and directly. The developing social pragmatics of AI and robotics industries play a huge role in the success of their products. By this, I mean in the last 10 or so years, speech recognition and face, face and emotion recognition algorithms have become increasingly better or more accurate. As of now, we don't really have conclusive evidence for how educational robots can be, but they can assist and can be pre-programmed for activities which help engage students. These socially assistive robots aim to serve as social catalysts and can be utilized in a form of peer skills training. The robots first provide an opportunity for a child with ASD to practice social skills one-on-one, -on -one, then with a sibling or therapist, then with other children. One of their main goals is to encourage inclusion of the ASD population. Typically developing children don't usually seek out children with ASD in activities such as free play, but with the presence of a robot in this setting, the children with ASD are gaining social support while typically developing children are also being drawn into the experience by the robot itself, promoting play interaction among all peers. When children with ASD are engaged and comfortable, they're better able to learn. Robots are off <clears throat> Robots are also very versatile and customizable to the individual needs and skills of a child with ASD. Children are often seen by the robot as less confusing and intimidating than their... I'm sorry. Children with ASD often see the robot as less confusing and intimidating than their peers because the robots are patient. Some are programmed to speak slower and can repeat things over and over again exactly the same without getting frustrated. And with limited range of facial expressions, robots are also look less likely to express emotions that could be misinterpreted or confusing to a child with ASD. Some of the major players in the field of socially assistive robots for children with ASD include Leica Now, Darwin OP2, and Milo. Leica's goal is to help children with ASD become more independent and improve their motor and social skills. Based on a child's abilities, users can customize the level of difficulty and how much guidance children get for each of Leica's games. Leica also monitors the child's progress by capturing and storing data on how the, child, the children interact with the robot. Now's tasks are semi-autonomous -auto educational applications inspired from various behavioral interventions and models like applied behavior analysis and um, PECS. For example, Now prompts a student waits for the appropriate response, and provides a reward when the response is correct or when the response is incorrect, encouragement, and a clue. Teachers can select and personalize tasks based on a child's individual learning goals, motivators, internal states, and personality. Now response to voice commands and tracks each child's performance. Darwin OP2 can engage children with ASD to do motor activities by playing soccer, dancing, and performing other activities. For example, Darwin OP2 can say in a monotone voice that he is excited to be friends and play soccer with you as he kicks a little ball. Milo, who, who you'll meet in the next slide, has proven to be very effective at reaching children with autism who have difficulty interacting socially with peers. Milo teaches the understanding and meaning of emotions and expressions and demonstrates appropriate social behavior and responses. Research conducted by the University of Texas at Dallas found that children working with a therapist and Milo are engaged 70 to 80% of the time compared to just 3 to 10% of the time with traditional approaches. And now you can meet Milo.
Sorry, everyone, about those technical difficulties. I'm reading your comments now regarding the sound. I couldn't hear it on my end, but I wasn't sure if maybe you guys could, and I didn't want to stop the video. Um, but I will be sure to make that link um, available when we do post the webinar to our YouTube channel. Um, it's a pretty neat little video, and Milo's a pretty cool character. I want to make sure that you guys get your information for that one and the Microsoft HoloLens as well. Um, but going back, some of the challenges that come with machine learning and robotics include the technical obstacles of the robot or AI itself understanding the user's intent, emotions, needs, and skills, all while evaluating and reacting in real time. Then the robot must behave in such a way as to engage the user, because if the user isn't engaged in interacting with the robot, they will lose interest and therefore won't benefit from the support the robot is offering. While robots can be programmed to be empathetic and non-discriminatory, these machines still cannot fully replace or replicate <clears throat> human emotion or understanding. These and all technology-based interventions should be used as a supplement to human interaction and traditional therapies. And lastly, I want to touch on applications. Some applications made available out there are designed specifically for children with ASD. You can filter through the these in search engines in the app or Google Play Store by searching with the keywords Autism Apps or AAC Apps. Um, and this diagram I have on the screen here is a list of iPad apps that support different evidence-based practices for autism spectrum disorders. There are hundreds and among thousands of apps available on the market today and hundreds more are being developed every week. The apps represented in this graphic are only a few examples of what is out there and are divided into only a few of the evidence-based practices we talked about earlier. Some of these apps can, of course, fit into multiple categories. Every child with ASD has individual needs, preferences, and characteristics. Is it, up to the, it is up to the parents and service providers to choose the best app for each child. If this is one form of technology-based interventions you are thinking of utilizing. Um, this infographic is meant, meant for informational purposes only to illustrate how apps support evidence-based practices and for you to use as you see appropriate. And like I said, again, this will be made available on our YouTube ch channel, so you won't have to, um, you won't lose access to this information. It will be up for grabs later. So now that I've given you kind of a brief overview, I hope that you can see the different and important roles technology can play in ASD interventions. The possibilities are seemingly endless, and as technology continues to advance, so will its role in the treatment of ASD. Lastly, I want to take a step back and look at the bigger picture. With all of the opportunities that advancing technology affords us as a society, is it, important, it is important to keep in mind one of the most basic reasons for developing it in the first place. Technology is about making the world more inclusive. The ability to access, gather, and share hordes of information among the population of the developing world is one of the main functions of technology today. By implementing different technological devices and softwares into ASD intervention strategies, we are offering an opportunity to communicate with, understand, and include people with ASD. For example, the AACs I mentioned earlier, these grant the opportunity to children with ASD and language or communication needs to communicate by compensating for or replacing speech. The UK National Autistic Society has created a virtual reality application that has been used to simulate what it's like being a child with autism. You can also view this as a video on their website, which I will also post with the link to the other videos that were silent during the webinar. Also, this past April for Autism Acceptance Month, Apple helped to raise awareness by creating a section in the App Store that included dozens of important accessibility apps. This category was only temporary and has since been removed, but the apps depicted in the photograph above are still available on the App Store for use today. Find and read about them individually by using the search feature. To recap, I want to, I want to remind you that many of the specific devices and our programs I've mentioned today have been used in interventions for ASD that are backed by peer-reviewed, published, or scientific literature exploring their effect on children with ASD. Established treatments are those that have been tested in, by controlled scientific experiments and have repeatedly shown beneficial results. Technology's role in these interventions varies and is gaining more empirical support every day. Current devices and software are being developed specifically for use by the ASD community. Many of the augmentative and 
alternative communication devices we talked about are fairly recent innovations and therefore don't have the scientific backing that older, more established treatments do. Nonetheless, these devices are being created and expanded upon every day. These new wave innovations can be more accessible, adaptive, portable, and customizable than older models and have come a long way in the past 50 years. I hope that with this webinar, I have outlined different areas of need in which technology can make a difference in the lives of children with ASD. Different forms of technology, namely apps, are developing every day, and I hope that highlighting the different roles that technology can play in addressing the symptoms of ASD, moving forward, you can better utilize these new tools in a way that works best for you and your families. And now we will take some questions, if there are any. And I'll just go over and look. So we have um, a question here that says, my son with ASD is 30 and most of the technology was not available when he was in school. He is very computer savvy. Can these apps be used without a therapist and are they applicable to an adult? His emotional IQ is very low and he enjoys cartoons and animation. Um, there, I don't, I'm not necessarily a certified official. I wouldn't be able to make that call. Um, I would definitely say that Choose wisely from the apps if you do decide to use them without a therapist. Personally, I would seek um, information from a therapist maybe regarding um, what specific apps would be beneficial for him and what his um, specific skills and needs may be. Um, and going from there, I think they could be applicable to an adult, just depending on what his skill sets may be. Um, they could, there are various levels of these apps. Um, I know for a fact there are the um, free and pro versions. The pro versions, of course, will be more expensive, um, but they do offer a lot more as far as complexity of the app goes. So to answer your question, technically, yes, they can be used without a therapist, but I think it would be um, smart and extremely beneficial for your son to be used under the recommendation of a therapist. Let's see. One other question. How can I get access to these devices? Um, well, it depends on the specific device you are interested in. Most of the apps are available for their respective devices. So if you have an iPad or an Apple product, those are going to be available to you on the App Store, on the Apple App Store. Um, if you have an Android or Google device, tablet, those will be available to you via Google Play. Um, most of the world wearable devices that I mentioned, like Reveal and um, Folio, the virtual reality, those are being crowdfunded by researchers at private labs or universities. Uh, many are available for pre-order or expected to be shipped out soon, um, but you can find that more, out more about those on their respective websites. Okay, let's see. 
Sorry, I just figured out a way to better read all of your questions. Now I can see them. Okay, um, here's one. Is there anywhere I can find a comprehensive list of apps that can be used by children with ASD? Um, personally, I have yet to come across one comprehensive list. Um, throughout my research in making the webinar, I found a handful of lists that each kind of outlined prices, um, what software the apps were available for, um, and what, if any, research they had to back, them, back up the use in their treatments. Um, Autism Speaks has a list on their website that does a good job of organizing that kind of information. Um, and I found a few of the other lists as well that I can link to the webinar when we post on our YouTube channel. So I can make a note of that. And we'll have that available to you within the hour. And then here's another question. Does the Apple Watch and Reveal allow for sensitivity in determining a rapid rate of escalating anxiety and stress? My son rapidly dysregulates less than 30 seconds. Um, reveal, I'm not sure how quickly they can determine that um, because it is still in its um, engineering phase, I believe. The way that it works is it measures your heart rate, um, electrodermal sensitivity, as well as your temperature, which are all, um, all play a big role in anxiety and stress. Um, how fast they would be able to determine, the goal of it is to build up over time, kind of learn your son's triggers, I guess you could say, what causes him to escalate anxiety. That way we can implement behaviors before he has those kinds of meltdowns. Um, I would like to say that it could happen within 30 seconds if after tracking his behavior in physiological states for so long, that would be ideal. But honestly, I just can't say for now. Um, the Apple Watch, on the other hand, I don't to my knowledge, it only has the heart rate tracker. The new series may or may not. Um, but they also can come out with different apps developed for specifically the Apple Watch that might be able to use different physiological trackers and track those changes for anxiety over time. Um, as of now, it just has the heart rate monitor. And I don't know of any way that it would notify you if it was getting, if it was raising too quickly. So I think that's just another area of research we'll have to keep an eye out for. OK, and I think we have time for one last question. Let's see. Our eight-year-old son was just diagnosed with high-functioning ASD. Is there a great place to start this journey with apps and technology? He was adopted from a foster care four and a half years ago. Um, you mentioned you see a psychiatrist. Honestly, I think that starting with a psychiatrist would be a great way to go. Um, he would ha probably have some of the best resources and best knowledge of any upcoming apps and technology and technology that's being introduced to the field. Um, also, he knows your son's specific skills and needs better than I would. Um, I wouldn't be able to make any recommendations based on that. 
but I think he could point you in the right direction for sure. Um, and it looks like it's about time um, to end our presentation. As a reminder, this webinar will be available at the Johnson Center YouTube channel for playback at any time. About an hour after the presentation is concluded, you should receive a link via email that will take you to the online questionnaire. Um, after filling out this questionnaire, you will be able to get your certificate of attendance for um, today's webinar. Thank you again, everyone, for joining me, and be sure to register for our next webinar, Everyday Opportunities to Teach Social Emotional Learning with Amanda Tammy. You can do this on our website at www.johnson-center.org. Thanks so much.